Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of DNews Plus. I'm Amy, guest hosting for Trace all this week. And on this episode, episode three of five about the Gemini Space Program, we're going to be looking about how NASA learned how to work in space outside of the spacecraft. Yesterday, we talked about how NASA learned how to stay in space long enough to get to the moon. So now we're looking at how NASA learned how to get outside once it got to the moon, and also while it was going to the moon, because there were deep space EVAs involved in the Apollo program. In later episodes, we're going to be talking about rendezvous, docking, and of course, splashdowns or how to get home safely from the moon. So make sure you subscribe to get all of those episodes. But for now, let's talk about how to walk in space. NASA wasn't exactly planning to send men all the way to the moon and then have them just look out the window. NASA wanted the men to actually step outside, gather rocks, survey the area, take pictures, and really explore the moon. There was no point in going a quarter of a million miles away and not actually engaging with the surface. So this meant that all new spacesuits had to be devised. The first spacesuits of the Mercury program were partial pressure suits because they didn't have to keep the astronauts alive outside the spacecraft. They were designed to work only in the pressurized spacecraft. Now, with NASA planning to send astronauts out into space and walking on the moon, spacesuits really had to evolve into being essentially wearable personal spacecraft. I did a whole episode on our sister show, D News, about spacesuits, so if you want to check that out and get the detail on that, uh, we've got a link for that below. NASA wasn't the only agency that understood the value of learning how to walk in space and developing a spacesuit that would keep astronauts alive outside the spacecraft. The Soviet Union knew that this would be really important as well. The Soviet Union beat the United States by getting the first satellite up in 1957 and again beat the United States by putting the first man in orbit in 1961. In 1965, the Soviet Union did it again by sending the first cosmonaut, the first human in history, out on a spacewalk or EVA, which stands for extravehicular activity. The cosmonaut was Alexei Leonov, and he had a very interesting experience during history's first ever EVA. The mission had Alexei Leonov step outside through an airlock while his pilot, Pavel Belyayev, stayed inside the spacecraft. So Belyayev didn't have to be outside the pressurized environment, just Leonov did. He was connected to the spacecraft by a tether, and he went outside, he waved, and he was out for about 10 minutes. And when he went to go back into the airlock to get back inside the spacecraft, he realized that his suit had inflated in the vacuum of space, that the oxygen in his suit had made it expand ever so slightly. He couldn't actually get his fingers to the edges of his gloves, so couldn't really use his hands, and he could feel his feet lifting up out of his boots. So he had absolutely no purchase against anything to try to maneuver himself back inside. He managed to kind of start moving his body, but he was too big to get back into the airlock because of how much his suit inflated. So this man manages to come up with a solution while traveling 17,500 miles per hour orbiting the planet. He very slowly and very carefully bleeds oxygen the life-giving oxygen out of his suit just enough to deflate the suit so that he could get back into the airlock and get back into the spacecraft. So that's insane. And that's not even the worst thing that happened to Leonov and Belyayev on that mission. Because it took Leonov so long to get back into the spacecraft after the EVA, they missed their re-entry and had to adjust their re-entry point. And they ended up landing in the forest in the Ural Mountains in March in like six feet of snow. They, and it was also mating season for wolves. But they had a gun, uh, Not it was just not a good situation. They landed in such thick forest, a helicopter was able to find them but couldn't get to them, couldn't lower down a rope to bring them up, tried to drop down brandy for them but it didn't work out. They ended up just spending the night huddled in their spacecraft trying to protect each other and themselves from the elements. On day two, because it's Russia, um, rescue crews were able to cross-country ski to where the cosmonauts were waiting, um, and they had to spend another night in the forest. But this time they had a fire and a cabin and vodka and sausages to eat, so that was a good thing. So having been beaten to this EVA goal by the Soviet Union, NASA decided to, to move its own EVA up in the the sort of massive list of things it was doing with Gemini looking ahead to Apollo. Gemini 4 was meant to be another kind of just increasing duration Gemini flight. And instead, NASA decided, well, maybe we'll make this one the first ever EVA flight. So um, Commander Commander Jim McDivitt and pilot Ed White. Ed White would be the one who would maybe be stepping outside the spacecraft. It was such a last minute addition to the flight plan. The crew and some of the support crew, the flight controllers, were actually training for this one in secret. They called it Plan X, and they actually only announced 
to the media and to the public that White would be doing an EVA weeks before launch. It was just, and it wasn't even made, there was no fanfare about it. It was just sort of, you know, page 12, potential EVA. And just all of a sudden, NASA is just taking this massive stride. It was a really good gamble that NASA took having White do that EVA on, on Gemini 4. He stepped outside and became the first American to successfully walk in space. And he was out twice as long as Lanov. And there's a really great story about White that he's he's out, he's floating, he's completely free of anything. He's tethered to the spacecraft. His communications and his life support was through a tether. Um, and there was some some glitch in the communications that the flight director was telling him to come back inside. And he really, really didn't want to go back inside. Right before he finally sort of started snaking his way back down the tether into the spacecraft, he just looked out and said, I feel like a million dollars. And it was just this really, really beautiful moment in Ed White's life um, to kind of move ahead a little bit. Ed White did die in the Apollo 1 fire in 1967. So his one mission was this historic mission of having this this beautiful moment of floating freely around the Earth, the first American ever to do so. Ed White had had some problems on his EVA. He had a little oxygen gun to maneuver with, but it ran out pretty quickly and it wasn't really good for helping him really kind of get around a little bit. He ended up having to kind of pull himself on the tether. It was all very awkward to move in space. The next mission to really focus on EVA as a goal was Gemini 9. And this was a really ambitious EVA. This mission had the pilot, Gene Cernan, snake his way across the Gemini spacecraft to the back adapter section to recover a manned maneuvering unit, which is basically like a jetpack, and then try flying around a little bit, still safely tethered, um, to figure out if this jetpack would be a really good technology for later missions. But NASA hadn't quite figured out how to move in space yet. If you've ever moved in a, tried to kind of run in a pool, you have some sense of how awkward it is. This is water resistance, but it's it's a similar thing in terms of you've got nothing to grab onto. You're, you're just kind of moving your own body to try to move. Cernan realized, Cernan learned way quickly how hard it is to move in space. In trying to get himself along the Gemini spacecraft towards the back, he worked up such a sweat. His faceplate fogged up. There was some problem with the cooling in his suit. He was overheating. He was dehydrating. He couldn't see anything. No one really knew what was happening, and neither did he because he was effectively blind by his fogged up faceplate. He got to the back of the spacecraft, and Tom Stafford, his commander, called it and said, there's no way I am letting you put on a jetpack and fly around if you can't see anything, and also you are covered in sweat. So Cernan laboriously maneuvers himself back into the spacecraft. It takes ages. He gets inside. He's completely, he's just wiped out. He gets back to Earth at the end of the mission and pours about a liter of fluid out of each boot because he sweat that much. This is not a good thing. <laughs> if, if NASA needs to have an EVA as an emergency measure, there was a provision on Apollo. If the crew needed to transfer between vehicles and couldn't do it, through the spacecraft, they would have to go outside. NASA needed to learn how to do this. And so it developed neutral buoyancy training, which is, I mentioned running in a pool. NASA uses a giant pool, and they still use this for the space station training today. Basically, what NASA figured out to do was to weight astronauts such that they would float in a pool with equivalency-ish to weightlessness. Um, of course, you have water resistance to push against, but it's a very good way of understanding how to move without gravity or in a microgravity environment. NASA also started doing more training for astronauts in the so-called vomit comet, the hollowed out airplane that flies in parabolas and gives astronauts a few seconds, about 20 seconds of weightlessness at the top of every arc as the plane goes up and then starts that fall back down. By the time the Gemini program came to a close, uh, Gemini 11, Gemini 12, um, NASA had added handrails and footholds onto the spacecraft and astronauts were able to move outside and actually maneuver and pull themselves around with relative ease and perform really solid EVAs to, to, to successfully recover things, to go outside, to look around, to explore. And the spacesuits were also, that technology was also coming together such that by the time the program ended in 1966, moving in space, maneuvering in space was something that NASA had also knocked off its list of things to do in going to the moon. Spacewalks are kind of incredible. If you've ever seen the pictures of astronauts on the ISS just floating around, it looks beautiful and stunning and it's amazing and crazy to think that somebody had to be the first person ever to step outside the safety of a spacecraft and just float around and trust that they would get back home safely. And I should add at this point, NASA provisions always said that if the spacewalking astronaut could not get back inside for any reason, the commander was supposed to leave him outside and come back alone. 
that's not a happy thought to end on. What are your favorite spacewalking pictures? And would you ever feel comfortable just stepping outside of a spacecraft doing an EVA? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the future episodes in this series. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can go back and watch those as well. Tomorrow, we're going to be getting into the oh-so-complicated world of space rendezvous and docking, which is far more counterintuitive than you might think, but it's also really quite fascinating and something that we're still using those lessons learned today. If you'd like to watch more about space right now, you can go back and watch Trace talk about Mars over five episodes right here. Or if you want to watch Trace and me together, we did an entire series about boobs. Thanks for watching, you guys, and see you next time.